Daddy says I'm not allowed to touch the dolls. They just sit in their glass cases. When I was little, I would cry and cry. I just wanted to hold them. They were so pretty. Some were larger than others. They all had unique faces. I had named them all based on what I thought they'd like to be called. I just wanted to be able to interact with them like I could with my other toys. How am I supposed to play with a doll I can't touch, I would ask. You'll ruin the dolls if you touch them, Daddy would say. I told him I wouldn't. I would be careful, but it was no use. He'd say I was too clumsy and the dolls were too fragile for me to handle. Since I couldn't play with dolls, I would keep their cases all stacked on a bookshelf in my room. I have 13 of them now. My father makes me a new one every birthday. I don't get to keep every doll he makes, though. He sells some, to other little girls and lonely old ladies, mostly. In the daytime, he works on cars, but at night he makes the dolls. It was mostly a hobby, but he has always promised that one day he'd quit cars and open his own little shop. Then he'd be able to make more money to take care of me. But I never cared much about money. I knew we were poor. I couldn't wear the nice new clothes the girls at school did, but my dad made sure to go shopping at the Goodwill store at least once every few months. That's enough for me. I was happy, so long as I had Daddy and my dolls. But eventually the dolls began to frighten me. I started turning the cases around at night so that only their backs faced me. My father asked me why, and I said that was how the dolls liked to sleep. The truth was that I couldn't sleep with them looking at me anymore. In hindsight, I don't know how I ever slept with them looking at me. I can't remember when they started whispering. I got used to it after a while. It was easier with the cases turned around. I could just ignore them that way. One night, though, I realized that the dolls could do more than whisper. I was seven. I was laying in bed when I got up to get a drink of water. As I walked past the shelf where the doll cases stood, I heard what sounded like a scratching sound. It seemed to be coming from one of the cases. I listened intently before turning around the case that the noise seemed to be coming from. It was Molly. Molly was the doll with two blonde braids and bangs hanging low above her green eyes. I stopped when I saw that, from the corner of her marble eye, a drop of red liquid had formed and begun slowly falling down her face. I vaguely wondered if dolls could bleed. In a strange combination of wonder and horror, I reached out my hand once more and let the tip of my finger graze the glass. As soon as my hand made contact, she screamed. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I know what I heard. No one can imagine a sound like that. Her case started rattling wildly as I ran sobbing and shrieking into my father's room. He was awake and I started panting about the doll. He asked what I was talking about and I said that surely he must have heard it. His face became very serious and he insisted that I must have been dreaming. Although he tried to console me, I refused to return to my own room until morning. The next night I decided I was going to open Molly's case. I was terrified of Molly now. But I had to prove to myself that I wasn't crazy. I had to prove Daddy wrong. I began by sneaking a butter knife out of the kitchen. When that didn't work, I snuck out the large chef's knife that Daddy uses to chop potatoes. I slipped the knife between the space at the top of the box where the glass met the metal hinge. I shook the knife back and forth. I had almost managed to shimmy the thing open when the knife sliced through my pointer finger, clear to the bone. I inhaled as much air as my lungs could carry and screamed my heart out. Thick streams of blood poured from my hand, dyeing the lace of my white nightgown a deep red. My father sprinted into my room. What have you done? He thundered. I was too afraid and in too much pain to do anything but cry in response. He dragged me by my arm into the bathroom. I thought he would wash my cut and bandage me. Instead, he practically threw me in the bathroom and warned me to think about what I had done before slamming the door shut. Unfortunately, in our house, the light to the bathroom was outside the door, so I was all alone and in the dark. I kicked and pounded at the door, but Daddy had barricaded it somehow. My hands stung and throbbed almost rhythmically. I vaguely wondered if Daddy had left me in the bathroom to die. Eventually, I crawled into the tub, curled my little body up as tightly as I could, and cried myself to sleep. When I woke, I was still in the bathroom, but I was no longer alone. All of my dull cases were stacked neatly around the rim of the tub. Even in the dark, I could see their glaring white eyes peering at me. My head felt foggy, and I wondered if my father had put them in there in some odd attempt to keep me company. Then, all at once, the cases shattered. Exploded, really. I screamed in pain as the sharp glass shards rained down upon my skin. The dolls all fell upon me at once. Their once placid faces contorted grotesquely to show expressions of agony and rage. 
They clawed at my nightgown and bit at my bleeding skin, wailing their grievances in my ears. As I felt darkness closing in around me, my eyes snapped open. I was still in the tub. Soft daylight poured through the blinds. There were no dolls, and the only blood in my nightgown was the blood from my finger. The door to the bathroom was open. All evidence pointed to the fact that the attack had been nothing more than a nightmare, but I've never forgotten it. That incident happened a few years ago. I forgave Daddy for everything. I realized it was my fault, really. Daddy had told me the dolls were important, and I hadn't listened, and I injured myself by being stubborn. I managed to forget about the dolls, too, for most of the year, until my birthday rolled around and I would be presented with a new one. I asked Daddy if I could have a different present this year. My laptop was an old, bulky model. I really needed a new one. Despite my request, I was given another doll with sand-colored hair, brown eyes, and a chubby, round face for my birthday. I sighed, looking at her on the shelf as my laptop froze again. I had to write a paper for school. It was Sunday and the library was closed. My dad was working, so I figured he wouldn't mind if I just borrowed his laptop for a few hours. I walked into his room to look for it, and it was open on his bed. I had no idea what the password was. I tried to call his cell, but it went to voicemail. On a whim, I tried my birthday. It worked. Dad was always so predictable. He had a million different windows open. I told him it's easier to use tabs, but he never listens. I was minimizing everything mechanically until I came to an open Gmail account. It caught my attention because the email account wasn't Daddy's. It was my mother's. My mother died when I was eight months old. My father says she died from sadness, whatever that means. He always told me that I was my mom's spitting image, and he was grateful she had given him a child before her passing. It was odd, though, because although an email was open, it apparently hadn't been sent to anyone. It was just saved as a draft. I wondered why my father would be looking through these things, but I figured maybe he'd been missing her. I felt a bit guilty since it was really none of my business, but curiosity overcame me and I decided to read the email anyway. I can't go on living this way. Earl has been so patient with me. He's done all he could to make me happy. But I'm miserable. I feel like I die every day. Earl says I have my baby girl to live for, but can I help that my oldest child was the one who held my heart? Isn't that how it always is? I see her every time I close my eyes. Raven, ringlet curls, soft pale skin, little red lips. My baby Snow is what I called her. She looked just like the princess from the fairy tale. Even when she got sick, she was beautiful. I was expecting her to lose her hair during the treatments, but she never did. Earl promised to give my baby back to me. He thinks he has, but I want to hold her. Earl says she's too delicate for that. You'll break her, she says, but what kind of kid breaks when held by her mother? What kind of a child can't be touched? I stopped reading. Suddenly, I felt a coldness radiate throughout my chest. Blood rushed to my head as I gently closed the laptop and placed it back on my father's bed. I walked into my room and looked at my doll collection. I had since stopped turning the cases around at night. My father convinced me that it was childish, so they all stood in their cases facing me, lined up in neat rows. On the second shelf in the third column stood a tall glass case enclosing a doll with black curls, pale white skin, and painted red lips. I had never noticed before, but she resembled me a bit. We were far from identical. I was blonde like my mother, but she might have been my... I started to hyperventilate. It seemed that all of the dolls were staring at me now. Their eyes engulfed me. I turned my eyes back toward the raven-haired doll. Right in front of one steely blue eye, the glass began to crack. Gasping and choking, I sprinted down to the basement. That's where my father worked on the dolls. I half expected them to be following behind me. Shards of glass sticking into fake marble eyeballs and buried in their synthetic hair. But they didn't follow me as I stumbled my way down to the basement. I don't know why I went down there. In a way, I suppose I wanted to escape the glare of overpriced two dozen eyes in my room, but I also was searching for something. I started looking around. A hammer, nails, paintbrushes, fabric, cutouts. I shuffled through it all. I didn't know what I was looking for exactly, but I knew that whatever it was, I would find it down here in this basement. I opened drawers, cabinets, my father's toolbox, nothing out of the ordinary, just more doll stuff and some cleaning supplies. After about 20 minutes, I felt frustrated, tired, and a little ridiculous. In exasperation, I leaned my back against the east-facing wall and allowed my body to slide down pathetically. Oddly, as I slid to the floor, I felt the wall shift a little. I stood up and pushed against it as hard as I could. It was no use. 
That's when I discovered the panel was slightly detached from the rest of the wall and there was two small semicircle cutouts in the wood. How had I not noticed that before? I was able to slip my fingers in on either side and pull hard. After three good tries, the thing gave, and I almost toppled over as the wood door and a flood of papers came pouring out from behind it. I realized that the documents consisted of newspaper clippings, homemade signs, printouts of internet articles, and even a few court records. I sat back down on the cement floor and began to read through them. Missing. Tanya Roper, age three. Blonde hair with bangs, green eyes, last seen wearing red romper, white tennis shoes, and hot pink backpack. Reward for information, 25000 Police found suspect in case of toddler who disappeared last June. Janie Cooper, missing, two and a half years old, 29 inches tall, red hair, freckles, green eyes. Last seen wearing blue overalls and a white t-shirt. Please call 609-817-3512 with any information. Parents of missing four-year-old write heart-wrenching public letter to daughter's kidnapper. We just want our baby to come home. There were dozens of them. I looked up and noticed that behind the wood panel was another small door. I suddenly felt grateful for the boy at summer camp last year who taught me how to pick open a lock with bobby pins and determination. When I finally managed to get the door open, the smell hit me before my eyes adjusted to the darkness. When I finally saw what lay behind the door, I screamed until my voice was hoarse. I managed to run and trip my way upstairs and out of the front door to the home of our neighbors, an elderly retired couple. They didn't believe me at first. They even scolded me for playing a cruel prank on them. It took me nearly half an hour to convince them that they needed to call the police. I live with a foster family now. I've had counseling. Everyone says I'm doing surprisingly well, given what I've been through. I'm debating now about whether to tell the therapist about the letter my father recently sent me from prison. My foster mom gave me the letter but said she didn't read it. I know I should tell my therapist, but I just want to put this all behind me, you know? Besides, it doesn't matter much. My foster parents say daddy will probably die behind bars. They think saying that will make me happy, but honestly, my father is the only real parent I've ever had. I don't like thinking of him in there, despite what he did. I have mixed feelings about the letter, really. In part, I was glad to hear from daddy since I do miss him, but I would be lying if I said his words didn't also make my spine shiver. In his own scraggly handwriting, my father wrote me the following. My darling daughter, I know I've done a lot to hurt you. I'm sorry for that. I love you with all my heart, and I want you to know that none of this is your fault. I'm going to appeal my conviction, and I have confidence that everyone will soon see that this has all been a big misunderstanding. I can't wait to see you again, sweetheart. Till then, just know that you'll always be my baby doll. My old college roommate Dylan lives just outside of Denver. Like most Colorado natives, he loves to camp. The crazy kind of camper who does it all year, even in December. Whenever he goes to the mountains alone, I have him check in with me just in case. I'm worried about him, so I'll get right to it. His texts are starting to scare me. The following is our latest text conversation. 2.30pm. Yo, I just parked my car heading to the trail now. You're crazy, man. How cold is it? Not bad, actually. 30s. You gotta come out here soon. It's beautiful. Ha. <laughs> well, we'll see in the spring when it warms up. Have fun, man. Watch out for the staircases in the forest. Nice, dude. Real funny. 7.44 a.m. Dude, are you up? Yes, sir. You okay? This is so weird. I woke up this morning and there's someone else out here. On the mountain? Looks like you're not the only winter camper. <laughs> no, not a camper. I can see them on the horizon, but they haven't moved. Like at all. What? I don't know, it definitely looks like a person, but they haven't moved. They're probably 300 yards away, but standing completely still. That's super creepy, dude. Keep me updated. 9.19 a.m. They still haven't moved. I made breakfast over the fire and acted like I didn't notice anything. I'm gonna check it out. I let me know. Maybe it's a stump or something. 9.33 a.m. Dude, it's a freaking scarecrow. What? Like a farmer scarecrow? Yeah, man. What the heck other kind of scarecrows are there? Its clothes are weird, though. How so? The clothes are modern. It's wearing a nice black jacket and jeans and stuff. Face is kind of scary. Burlap sack with black eyes and a huge smile stitched on it. Why is this thing out here? I'm tempted to steal its North Face jacket. I posted a pic of it on my Snap story if you want to see what it looks like. I don't know, dude. I'd leave it alone. Maybe it's some sort of conservation study or something like that. Like to see if bears will attack it. You might be on camera. And I know you have weed and shrooms on you. 
<laughs> Good point. Speaking of which, time to pack a bowl. Have fun. 3.33 a.m. Someone is outside my tent. I'm sure. Dude, please, this is serious. I can see their shadow. Call the police, Dylan. No, I don't want to make any noise. They probably think I'm asleep. I have my knife. I'm texting inside my sleeping bag so they can't see my phone light. I thought I heard a noise and I woke up. I guess I didn't zip up my tent all the way and I assumed it was the wind, but then I saw the silhouette. What the heck, man? Should I call the police for you? Where are you? Latitude and longitude now. Dylan? Dude, please respond and drop a pin so I know where you are. 6.56 a.m. I'm all right. Thanks for finally responding. I just about had a heart attack. Barely slept. I was going to call the police or ranger station, but I don't know where you're at. There's something weird, though. Their scarecrow is right outside my tent. Someone put it there last night while I was asleep. That's the shadow I saw. I don't like this at all. Go home, man. Seriously, that's messed up, even if it's a joke. I'm about four miles from my car. I'll text you when I get back to it. Also, I forgot to mention something. What? My hat was on top of the scarecrow this morning. Someone must have gotten to my tent last night while I was asleep and put my hat on its head. Text me ASAP. That was earlier. Hopefully he gets back okay. Three dots. It looks like he's responding. 9.13 a.m. Aw, oh, crap. Someone slashed my tires and there's another scarecrow by my car. I've been working with the Denver Park Rangers and police, and they're not telling me anything. They said that they have the situation under control, and I'm not convinced. Here's my last conversation with Dylan. 9.25 a.m. Please tell me you're calling the police. Hang on, I'm going to go see how bad of shape the car is in, and yes, I'm calling them. All right, let me know ASAP. 11.45 a.m. What's going on? 12.30 p.m. We'll text later. Not safe. Dylan, please let me know what's going on. 2.15 p.m. All right, I have a second to catch you up. I can call you, but I have to keep my voice low. This is so messed up, dude. I don't know what to do. I don't want to be here. Also, my iPhone is dying, and I'm going to have to switch over to the crappy flip phone I use for work. What the frig, dude? What do you mean by not safe? So I went to try and start my car to get a quick charge on my iPhone and see how bad the tires were. The engine wouldn't even turn over. The scarecrow was standing right in front of my car like a foot away. It smelled so bad, dude, like rotting meat. I called the police and told them about the car and that I was stuck. They transferred me to the ranger station to explain where I was for assistance. That's when it got weird. What do you mean? The ranger seemed pretty lax about it at first, like, where are you? Stay calm. Well, send help. Just stay where you are, etc. Monotone voice like he's used to it. But then I mentioned the scarecrow, and the ranger was different. Different? He became really serious and panicked. Here's how it went. Ranger. Did you say scarecrow? Yes, sir. I need you to be very clear and very honest, son. What exactly did it look like? I described the one back at the camp wearing my hat. And you said there is one by your car now? Yeah, and it smells terrible. What is this one wearing? Nothing, just burlap and cloth. This one's face is frowning. Oh, wait. It looks like something is on its chest. It has a piece of paper pinned to it. Anything else? Yeah, something is written on the paper. Son, I need you to listen to me very carefully. Okay. I have some bad news. I'm in my truck now and I was headed your way. The bridge leading into your trail is partially collapsed and impassable. We're not sure how it happened, but we have emergency crews working on it now. I need you to start moving this instant. Right now you're at the north side of the mountain and I need you to go to the south face. That's where we'll meet. Do you have a compass and map? Yes, sir. Good. All right, here's the exact point to meet. He explained where to go. That's the exact point where I will meet you. Do not stay where you are. Get away from your car. Most importantly, do not hang around any of those scarecrows. Do you understand me? If you see any more, I want you to run as fast as you can away from it. Clear? I will. Trust me. I need you to keep moving. What's going on? Am I in danger? What does the scarecrow have to do with anything? Listen, just keep moving while the sun is up, and make as little noise as possible. Are you wearing bright clothing? Uh, no, I'm not. I have a dark brown coat and gray pants. Good. Try and stay out of plain sight as much as possible. Now move quickly, and call me if you see or hear anything unnatural. Unnatural? You'll know, but only make phone calls if absolutely necessary. When night falls, stay warm and hidden. No fires. If you hear anything in the night, do not run. Stay as still and quiet as possible. Wait, will you tell me what I should be looking for? Get moving south now. Wait, I... Then he just hung up. Me. Where are you now? Moving south. There's creepy stuff going on. What do you mean? 
I walked by the spot where my campsite was last night. The scarecrow, the one that was wearing my hat, it wasn't there. Just gone? Yes, nothing at all. Dude, I'm so sorry you're going through this. My eyes are watering just reading your text. I hate this, man. I just want to be home. You gotta do what the ranger said and we'll get you out of there. Do you have any data on your work phone? No, just talk and text. Great. Plenty of battery? Yes, thank God. 3.03 p.m. I'm exhausted and scared as hell. Still making my way to the other trail on the south side to meet the ranger. Keep moving. 3.44 p.m. I see the scarecrow. The one from my camp. It's up in a tree. Way up in a tree. Dude, how did it get so high up there? What? Send me a pic. I can't get a good shot. It's so high up and this camera sucks. It's just hanging there. It looks like it's staring at me. I'm so freaked out and tired. Something is dripping off of it. Get away from it, Dylan. 4.17 p.m. The sun's about to set. I'm going to find a place to sleep. Dylan, you never told me what was on that note. The one that was pinned to the scarecrow by the car. 4.32 p.m. Oh, crap. You're right. It said, are you scared yet? Who the frig do you think is doing this? Dylan? 7.01 p.m. Dylan, are you okay? Text me back when you can. I don't want to waste your battery. 2.02 a.m. It's getting closer. What is? 2.04 a.m. Crap, it's right next to me. Oh god, I need help. Frank, what is this thing? Oh my god, oh my god, is this thing even human? It can't be. It stopped. Uh, I'm behind a tree. I don't know if it knows where I am. Oh, Frank, that smell, it's so bad. I'm gonna make a run for it. It's... It's it's too close. Ah, oh, Frig, please tell me you're okay. What is it? Dylan? 2.19 a.m. Dylan, I'm going to call the police. Ah, oh, crap, dude. What happened? 2.49 a.m. I called the police. They are looking for you at the south face. Where the ranger said he would meet you. Please, please, please tell me you made it. 2.57 a.m. Dylan? 3.33. Hello. Dylan, are you okay? What happened? Hello. Dylan? Hello. 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 What? What is this? 4.13 a.m. Are you scared yet? 4.14 a.m. What the frig? Where the crap are you? Are you okay? Dylan! That's the last I've heard from him. I am working with the authorities now and they are trying to track Dylan's phones. Update. I just heard back from the police. All they found was another scarecrow. It was sitting in the driver's seat of Dylan's car. It was wearing a dark brown coat and gray pants. The scarecrow was filled with meat. They're not sure what kind. The police are having me fly out to Denver now. As soon as I landed in Denver, I powered up my cell. I had a series of texts from Dylan's phone. I'm not sure what time they were sent. 7.45 a.m. Come find me. Who the frig is this? Where's Dylan? I'm with the police. We will find you. There was no response. After I got my luggage, I rented a small truck and drove to the ranger station. The police officer I spoke with told me they were letting the ranger handle the investigation now. As soon as I arrived, I was escorted to a back room. I assumed it was the same ranger that had talked to Dylan. He was a lanky, disheveled man with shaggy black hair and pale white skin. He reeked of smoke and looked like he hadn't slept in years. I sat down across from him. He placed his hat on the table, lit a cigarette, and spoke. We called you down here because, at first, we needed your phone as part of the investigation, but I'm afraid that is no longer necessary. His raspy voice was tattered and broken. His clothes shared the same features. What happened? I'm sorry, but I cannot discuss any details at the moment. You need to leave this to the professionals. We will do everything we can to find your friend. That's bullcrap. I'm so sorry, but we cannot have civilians interfering. We need you to stay safe and out of the way. I got text messages from his phone right after I landed. Something happened to him. I know this is hard. We are searching all possibilities, but we do not believe there was any foul play. Teenagers in the area have been known to play pranks on lone campers. You are more than welcome to help us with reports. I know how hard it is to lose a friend. Oh, and these teenagers slash tires and steal phones to send violent threats to? Do something! You even told Dylan that he was in danger. I promise we are working night and day. I think the best thing to do is stay off the trails and be there for his family, and I couldn't even let him finish his sentence. I was too upset. I stormed out, and he didn't attempt to stop me. I know that was all bullcrap. What was he trying to keep from me? I had text evidence that Dylan was being followed by someone or something. 
I'm going to figure this out. I went to the only place I was familiar with in the area, Dylan's apartment. I still remembered his door code from the last time I had visited. The apartment was eerily quiet. I was overcome with feelings of fear and sadness. As soon as I saw a picture of Dylan in the kitchen, I couldn't help it. I had to cry. After a few moments, I collected myself, opened the fridge, and pulled out a beer. I needed to sit and think. As I got up to throw the empty beer away, I saw something in Dylan's kitchen. His Colorado map. I had forgotten all about it. Dylan used this large topographical map to keep track of all the places he trekked. The map was riddled with black thumbtacks and a few white ones. Dylan's method was simple. Black thumbtacks for the areas he had already explored and white for his upcoming adventures. I wrote the coordinates of the white markers. I searched through Dylan's apartment and collected the remaining camping gear. I grabbed a wooden baseball bat from his closet as well. I knew where to go. I loaded the truck, tossing the supplies in the truck bed and headed to the mountain. It was a long drive, and eventually I passed the old bridge on the way. I didn't notice any signs of recent construction. Ten minutes later, I pulled up next to Dylan's car. It was eerie to see the yellow police tape wrapped tightly around the body of his white sedan. It made the situation all too real. As soon as I parked the pickup, I dropped a pin on my phone. After what seemed like an eternity of hiking, I reached the point on the map where Dylan had marked, and I got to work setting up camp. I was running out of daylight. I constructed my tent and placed a sleeping bag inside. As soon as night fell, I lit a large fire and quickly snuck away from camp. I took cover in the trees about a hundred yards away. I posted up beneath a large tree, cracked open an energy drink, and kept my eyes glued on the tent. 11.13 p.m. Nothing. I thought I heard a few footsteps rustling in the leaves, but I chalked it up to the wildlife. 12.02 a.m. It was quieter. Still nothing. 1.10 a.m. Oh, crap! I yelled as I jumped. I almost had a heart attack. Three deer walked by me. I had started to nod off and they woke me up. 2.23 a.m. I was exhausted, cold, and trying to stay awake. I drank my last bit of caffeine. 3.11 a.m. I saw something, walking towards the tent. It was a man. With a flashlight, he started looking in and around my tent. What the frig? 3.13 a.m. He noticed no one was in the tent and started shining a flashlight around the woods. He didn't see me. 3.19 a.m. He started leaving and headed south. I followed. I took off my boots so I could walk quietly. I threw on a couple more pairs of wool socks and kept my distance. 4.01 a.m. I continued to follow, taking countless turns in the dark. He seemed to be wandering, shining the flashlight in front of him as he walked. 4.17 a.m. He finally stopped near a pile of leaves. He tripped on something and started brushing away the leaves. Then I saw his face. It was the park ranger. There were doors under the pile, huge metal cellar doors. A chain was fastened around the handles and the doors led straight into the ground. He stopped to smoke a cigarette, pulled a notepad from his coat pocket, and scribbled something down. After he finished writing, he started looking through a flip phone. There was no way. I sent a text. 4.19 a.m. Where is Dylan? 4.20 a.m. This piece of crap had Dylan's phone. It chimed right after I sent the text. He freaking read it and whispered to himself, I told you to leave it to the professionals, and put the phone back in his pocket. I wanted to kill him. I was blinded by rage. He started undoing the chains and making a lot of noise. I couldn't let him disappear from my sight. I was running out of time. 4.28 a.m. I did it. I freaking hit that piece of crap in the skull with the bat. Right before he opened the doors, I swung as hard as I could. He fell to the ground and didn't move. The chain rested next to his bleeding temple. He never heard me coming. I'll never forget the sound when the bat connected. That dull thudding crack of solid wood smashing into bone. Sweat and blood misted in the air as he fell. I opened the cellar doors and wish I hadn't. It was the smell, a putrid stench of rotting flesh, that hit me first. As soon as I saw the first limb sticking out of the massive mound of corpses, I had to look away. My head was spinning and my stomach turned over. I ran. I was mortified by what I had just seen. 6.48 a.m. I just got back to Dylan's apartment. I was still sweating and breathing heavily as I bought a plane ticket for the next flight home. I decided the best plan was to call the police when I landed. I just wanted to go home. My heart was pounding. 8.58 a.m. Red and blue lights flashed outside as a police car pulled up to Dylan's door. I had to try and keep my cool. I spoke with the officer. I felt like I was going to vomit. As we were talking about Dylan's disappearance, the officer's radio receiver sounded. I listened in horror. 
Some campers discovered a scarecrow strung high in a tree with a noose around its neck. The campers claimed dark liquid was seeping through its burlap skin and it was wearing a park ranger's hat. My thoughts began to race. I've made a huge mistake. The ranger was just investigating a lead which led him to the cellar. He must have found Dylan's phone after I got those weird texts. But how did he get a key to the cellar? I... I acted so quickly. I hit him with the bat and ran. Uh, what have I done? I just left him to die, and most importantly, that cellar. What the frig was that? My phone chimed. I had a text from an unknown number. 10.10 10 a.m. Why did you run?